Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, today's seminar is by Emery Trott. He's at the University of Michigan, uh, where he works with Dragon Hutera. Uh, he's going to tell us about gravity waves uh, and the Hubble constant. Okay, Emery. Great. Uh, thanks for letting me talk to you all today. So I'm going to, like you said, be breaking down a little bit about dark siren gravitational waves and the Hubble constant. We're going to run through uh, a little bit of motivation with the Hubble tension, standard measurement techniques, uh, a little bit of background just to get us all on the same page on gravitational waves, their sources, how we detect them a little bit. And then I'll spend most of my time on uh, what my paper last year was on, which is dark sirens and the Hubble constant. And then hopefully we'll have uh, a little bit of time at the end to talk about some future work. So like I said, to get us on the same page, the very basics, we have propagating oscillations in a gravitational field that are gravitational waves, directly analogous to accelerating charges, uh, creating electromagnetic waves. Now it's just accelerating masses. And you've probably heard about gravitational waves in a few different contexts. There's like a stochastic background that people are interested in from supermassive black holes or uh, you know, B modes from inflation. We're not talking about those types today. We're talking specifically about those that are you know, transient yeah. emitted by uh, compact astrophysical objects. So why do we care? Always good to motivate it. Uh, the figure on the left here, we see this from a 2019 Reese paper, and it's a, it's slightly outdated now. We now have a five sigma tension between the Planck and large scale structure measurements of the Hubble constants, the expansion rate, accelerated expansion rate of the universe, right? Uh, they prefer, you know, 67. And then we have the type 1a supernova, uh, the, the sort of the, the late universe measurements coming in five sigma higher than that. So we'd like to have gravitational waves sort of weigh in on this question um, because we want to know whether there's maybe a systematic problem with some of these existing probes or if there really is a legitimate tension that points to new physics. So there have been you know, several review papers. I picked one from Leonardo de Valentino from last year, sort of showing all of these different models that uh, you know, early dark energy is one that you've probably heard of. That's a whole different class, a whole class of, of tons of different models uh, of sort of lambda CDM extensions. Uh, There's also an H not Olympics paper that sort of investigated how the best uh, the best fits from these and. If I remember correctly, the uh, time varying electron mass one, which was kind of perplexing. But anyway, potentially new physics here that we're interested in probing. So we want to do that by using gravitational waves as a standard siren. So you're probably familiar with other standard measurements like BAO being a standard ruler or type 1a supernovae being standard candles. We want to use gravitational waves as standard sirens. Uh, because you know, we call them sirens instead of candles because it's more like a sound. We'll talk about, you'll see the, the detection uh, chirp up in frequency in a little bit. But the general idea is we want to get some luminosity distance from the LIGO Virgo CAGRA collaboration. And then we want to add in some redshift in information. And that's what we'll spend a lot of time talking about is whether we can actually sort of break this degeneracy between distance and redshift. But if we can, then we can get at the Hubble constant. So that's our ultimate goal is to use standard siren technique on these gravitational waves, uh, take distance from LIGO, get redshifts from another source, and use that to measure. <clears throat> so just to get us on the same page uh, and sort of visualize what we're looking at here, this is a simulation from Max Planck Institute of a binary black hole system. Of unequal masses here. You can see the time scale. We're talking tens of milliseconds. It's throwing off gravitational wave, <clears throat> excuse me, radiation as they're orbiting. The period, orbital periods are getting shorter and shorter. They're throwing off the, the primary, uh, the, the leading order non zero mode here is quadrupole radiation. And now we're getting just a few milliseconds away. And you can see the frequency is ramping up as they continue to in spiral. And we'll just get a couple more orbits here before these two objects merge. We get our maximum frequency. And now they're merged, and then we have ring down. So it's this sort of signal that LIGO is looking for from these types of merger events. 
So here's the types of populations we're talking about. The, that simulation was of uh, two black holes. And as you can see, the, the vast majority of the events that they're looking at are black holes that are in blue here. So what they're showing is you have two masses. M1 is the, the larger of the, the sort of initial masses, and then M2 the smaller. And they would merge into a heavier object that is slightly less mass than the sum of the two initial ones, with, of course, some the rest of that energy being uh, emitted in the form of gravitational waves. So primarily black holes. And then you can see there's also some neutron stars and the sort of difference between these two populations will become uh, hopefully evidently important later on in this talk. Um, there's even some objects here in the two to five solar mass mass gap that are sort of unresolved as to what they are. But we're talking primarily black hole mergers, uh, some neutron star mergers, and this general idea of hierarchical mergers. So you have some initial population of black holes that merge to form you know, the next generation of more massive black holes that the, can then uh, merge and, and so on and so forth. And so if we look at that statistically in the merger rate, so on the y-axis of this plot, we have the merger rate of the M1 population. So the, just looking at the more massive um, of the two objects in, in a binary. And this is well fit. There's just a couple different fitting functions from LIGO. Um, you generally have what we call a, a power law plus peak. So the main power law that peaks at 10 solar masses uh, is very well explained by just this hierarchical merging of, of smaller mass objects into larger ones. Uh, and then there's this secondary peak at 35 solar masses. Sidebar, there might, depending on which function you look at, there may or may not be a third one at, at 18, but the primary two are 10 and 35. There's a paper earlier this year suggesting that the 35 solar mass one could also be explained by uh, hierarchical mergers, but in globular clusters with smaller infall times, that's still uh, an, an open question. There were some sort of spin conditions on that for to, to, to be able to, to match this population exactly. But um, this is the type of distribution we're looking at with, with power law plus peak. So we have seen the signal. We know what object we're talking about. Here's uh, Virgo, which is one of the detectors that's used to, to measure these. If you're probably familiar with these, you have just an L-shaped interferometer where in the super oversimplified version of it, you're sending these beams uh, down these several kilometer long tunnels, bouncing them off a mirror. And if there's no gravitational wave signal, then the phases of the waves will be such that they perfectly destructively interfere back at the detector and you get no signal. But if you have a gravitational wave, then you're going to be uh, having causing a strain on these arms. So you're going to get fractional length changes in these arms as the gravitational waves pass through. And that's going to change the relative phase of the waves, and you're going to get a signal. So exactly what signal is that? Well, it's a it's a polarized signal that is, as I, the intro said, sort of distorting as uh, its space as it's propagating through. You have a plus polarization state where you're compressing along one direction and stretching along the orthogonal direction as it's moving through. Uh, that's the plus polarization state. And then you also have one that shifted 45 degrees in the cross polarization state. So your detector is ultimately going to measure some superposition. So this is actually sort of the inherent uh, amplitude of the wave H. If we were talking about the detected amplitude, there would also be some response functions here in front of each of these. But you're getting some superposition of the plus and cross polarizations and the rest of this slide uh, is not super critical to the dark siren uh, discussion that we'll be having later on, but I just wanted to highlight that we're going to be making a lot of sort of simplifying assumptions later on, and there are some sort of inherent systematic challenges to any distance measurement from gravitational waves that I don't want to just sweep under the rug. So, you know, we're trying to get at this distance, of course, but there's degeneracies between the chert mass, which you can sort of just think of as a, a reduced mass uh, degeneracy with that, and redshift, right? So is it sort of large and far away or smaller and, and closer? Um, and then the more famous one probably is this inclination angle degeneracy, where you know if we consider two black holes, let's say, orbiting each other here, and you have some you know momentum vector pointing uh, 
you know, out of this and you know, normal to that that plane. And then we have some other vector and let's call it, as it's called here, sort of pointing to where we're gonna ultimately detect it. And that, that angle between those is the inclination angle. And it's important just because it's going to change both the amplitude of your, uh, of your wave, as well as the relative amounts of plus and cross polarization. So, you know, if you have a, an edge on case where it looks like it's just going back and forth, then you're gonna get purely plus polarization because this, this one's gonna go away. Uh, whereas if you're seeing it face on, then you're gonna get equal amounts of both. So that's, uh, you know, something that you'll hear a lot of people who work on the detection side of things are interested in this as, as systematics. Uh, I didn't wanna to sweep those under the rug, but for the most part, for the rest of the talk, we're just going to be assuming that whatever distances LIGO gives us are um, accurate and just that they have some associated uncertainty with them. All right, so that's my super quick brief introduction to gravitational waves, what they are, how we detect them, why we are interested. We wanna resolve the Hubble tension or at least weigh in on it. Uh, we're using one to 100 solar mass binary mergers. So either black hole, black hole, black hole neutron star or neutron star, neutron star. We're gonna look for the combination of the plus and cross polarization distortions in space time using an L-shaped interferometer that's gonna have these fractional length changes or strain. And there are some degeneracy problems between distance, chert mass, redshift, and inclination angle. And we're gonna focus exclusively for the rest of the talk on just this distance redshift that uh, in the sort of simplified low redshift picture will directly get us information about the Hubble constant. All right, so we wanna use these standard sirens to get at the Hubble constant. You know, how do we expect to do? We know that the supernova measurements crossed the, or, or right around the sort of 1% threshold as of last year. How do we uh, expect the gravitational waves or when do we expect them to be competitive? So this is from a Chen Fishbach and Holtz Nature paper from 2018. I think the title is quite suggestive. It's a 2% Hubble constant measurement from standard sirens within five years. And that was four years ago. I can tell you that, uh, well, you'll see where this stands, but this is primary, primarily relying on an increase <clears throat> in the number of binary neutron star systems. We'll talk about why that's important in a second. And you know, if we got the sort of expected number as we're sitting here at the end of 2022 to have you know, tens of events, and we'd be approaching this sort of 2% uh, measurement and start being competitive. So right, that's, that's the whole picture, right? We just detect more events and we'll be at 1% in no time. Uh, but as you can probably predict based on the fact that we're only uh, 10 or 15 minutes into this talk, there's a lot more to that. There's a big problem, which is that if we look at uh, all the events that LIGO is seeing, this is not quite all of them. This is through just A and B of observing run three. There's roughly 90 events. And this is just showing the, you know, in black, the black holes that go into the uh, final mass here. And if you can spot how many of them are highlighted in green instead of black, and I can highlight them for you there, there's only two neutron star, neutron star mergers, and only one that uh, was actually, you know, this is the famous 1708-17, where there was an observed electromagnetic counterpart. So I should say, because I said this was uh, slightly outdated, there are, you know, 90 something events. So let's say order 100 events, and there's approximately five neutron star, neutron star mer mergers uh, observed. It's always a, a little fluid because it's just, uh, their classification of whether the event has a greater than 50% chance of being of astrophysical origin. But, you know, we're talking about 5% or less of the total detections being neutron star, neutron stars, and only one of them uh, actually having an observed electromagnetic counterpart. So why is that important? Well, that means that the vast majority of the events are what we call dark sirens. So these are the ones without observed electromagnetic counterparts. The observed electromagnetic counterpart events are called bright sirens, We're talking about the 99% you know, or 98% that are dark sirens. So if we return to our uh, distance equation that we'd like to use, 
where you just think of the simplified version where it's D equals CZ over H naught. We want to get our distance information from LIGO. We'd like to get our redshift information from some EM follow-up survey that's able to exactly pinpoint the redshift uh, of this event, and we'd be able to nicely get a measurement of the Hubble constant. But, like I said, the vast majority of these don't have uh, observable electromagnetic counterparts. Most of them we don't even expect to, and then some of them that there could have been, uh, we just didn't find them. So we have to come up with other more creative ways of breaking this degeneracy between uh, distance and redshift. So how do we do that and what does it look like? If we look at the detection of an event here, so this is 1708-14, uh, this is something that Marcelli Suarez Santos, who's also here at Michigan, looked at. There's the localization, so it's observed by the two LIGO detectors and the Virgo detector. And rather than getting some precise redshift measurement, they have some region of the sky that they follow up in. So we're talking angularly something like 10 degrees by maybe 20 degrees and a distance of you know 500 plus or minus 200. So a pretty big region of the sky that we're talking about. And what you'd like to do is say, okay, well, we have this localization region. How do we get information out of it? And this is what I'm gonna be talking about for the next little bit of the talk is the, the Bayesian solution. And I put a little you know, question mark after solution because the conclusion that I'm ultimately gonna to get to with this method is that it has some challenges. And it's not that it can't work, it's that I think it only works under a, a certain set of parameters um, that you need to essentially be close enough to the bright siren limit that you can't just have sort of arbitrarily large uncertainties and expect to recover an unbiased result. But we'll, we'll walk through that. The general idea is that, okay, we don't have exact redshift information, but we do have some knowledge of where it is in the sky. And so this is our contour here of the localization that LIGO gives us, or LIGO Virgo gives us in this case, and it's overlaid on top of a DES galaxy distribution. So the idea is that we let each galaxy you know, vote on its preferred H naught, and then we weight that vote by the probability that that galaxy is actually the true host. So in this sample, you know, out to redshift 0.25 with you know this this angular localization, we have. Uh, I think this was something like 77,000 potential host galaxies. So uh, still plenty of potential hosts that, that doesn't help us out. But what we want to do is sort of go to each one and have it say, okay, if I am the true host, then I'm going to prefer an H naught of 65. And then we say, okay, you know, noted. And then how close are you to the center of this localization region? And we downweight you accordingly based on uh, sort of how far you've fallen, and most importantly in the radial space, right? Because we're interested in, in distances. Uh, and then we, you know, we go to the next one and it says, I prefer 80. And then we downvote it by, or downweight it by how far it is again. And we do this for all 77,000 galaxies in that region. So to really understand the, the, what's going on here with all these terms in our, our posterior equation here, I'm gonna break this down uh, one by one here. So the first one, is that weighting function. So I call it PDGW. And what it's really doing is, so it's taking the gravitational wave distance that LIGO has given us, and it weights the entire parameter space of possible luminosity distances given our priors on Z and H naught. So, you know, we have some range of, uh, of Zs and H naught. We take all different combinations of them that each corresponds to a luminosity distance and with some you know, Gaussian weighting, we say, okay, you know, here's how likely um, each point in our parameter space is of, of being the true host given what LIGO has told us. So that's what's weighting our votes. Now we actually need the votes themselves too. So that's where our P of Z comes in, it's just our probability distribution of galaxies in redshift space. And uh, so we model each one just simply as a Gaussian. So each individual galaxy is just has some photometric redshift error associated with it. Um, we, we do a little bit of, uh, this is a sort of simplified 
model that I'll, I'll come back and, and uh, flesh out a little bit more later. There is, it's, it's not purely Gaussian. There's a, a DES like um, 0.013 times one plus Z sort of photometric error associated with it. But you know, to, to zero authority or to first order, it's just a, a Gaussian with uh, you know each vote being summed up, and you combine these two terms, right? So we have our our votes and our weights on those votes, and uh, that's that's the majority of what's going on here. Now there's one last little bit that's uh, we can simplify these PEM and PGW detectability terms. So what these are essentially doing are asking the question, do we have survey completeness? So we have two surveys going on, right? We have our GW search with LIGO. We have our EM search with, let's say, DES. And you know, if we're missing something in our sample, then you know, we, we need to account for that. So you know, if, for example, we are luminosity limited or our detectability you know, realistically is probably going to you know, fall off with redshift or something like that, then we'd have to account for that. And there's ways of, uh, of writing these more generally in terms of um, you know, catalog completeness and whatnot. And you can check out the, the Chen, Fishbach, and Holtz Nature paper appendix if you're interested in that. But for the purposes here, and because again, the sort of punchline is we think there's problems with just the statistics of this method, we're willing to grant some of these simplifying assumptions. And so if we assume completeness, then we can just simplify it to you know, integrating up to some um, to some maximum luminosity distance that corresponds to our, our redshift cut and the uh, the H not priors that we've used. So that that simplifies things quite a bit in the denominator. And now we're ready to put it all together. So we have our our numerator, denominator, and our our final posterior here. This is just for one event. And what you can see here is we have so you can think of the uh, the dashed curve here, the numerator, as being our, that's our votes times our weights, right? So our weighted parameter space times all the votes that we got on what the preferred H naught of each galaxy is. And then we have to sort of downgrade that or, you know, suppress that with our, our denominator. And you can think of the denominator as essentially being a, a volume correction. So it's saying, you know, of course we expect there to be more votes from high redshift where there's simply more volume. And so we need to account for that um, by you know, killing off some of those uh, high H naught votes accordingly relative to our, our galaxy population that's increasing volumetrically. And so when we do that, you can see the sort of interplay of these two where the numerator is uh, you know, outgaining the denominator here. And that gives us our peak in our posterior. So that's the general sort of outline of this method. We have our votes and our weights. We need to have this volumetric correction, assuming that we have some completeness of our catalog, which again is sort of a, a generous granting that we're willing to do in this case. And for a single event, this is something like what the posterior would look like. Of course, there's randomness in terms of you know, what distances you're drawing um, and assuming that your, your uncertainties are. And we'll get into to all that in just a second. So we, of course, don't want to look at a single event, though. We want to repeat this. So each one of these black curves in the background here is one of these curves that we just saw. Do it 200 times, and we get something like this in blue, where it's the product of the 200 events. So we would like this to recover our input value of 70. And we'll talk a little bit about you know, why do we expect it to be 70? How do we actually enforce that input? But this is uh, you know, combining the events, and we'd like to recover some unbiased thing. And uh, I'm going to unpack a little bit sort of what the factors are that contribute to you know, this is actually a, a relatively good case. And in some cases, we can exactly recover 70, but then it starts to sort of diverge as we change some of these important parameters. OK. So. It's at this point that I have to admit, I, I pulled a little bait and switch on you. Um, when I showed you this, and I showed you this, uh, this red curve that I said was the galaxy votes, you can see this is a, just a purely smooth, you know, sum of Gaussians giving us another Gaussian sort of thing. 
when uh, obviously in, in reality, real galaxy distributions don't look that smooth. And it turns out that's critically important to this method that they don't look smooth. So what is actually happening is when I went to here, I, I substituted in something that has some amount of galaxy clustering to it. So that's what we're seeing here. And uh, I should maybe pause and mention, I don't know what the, the backgrounds of the people in the room are, but when I was explaining this to someone on, on LSST, they were very confused at what I meant by galaxy clustering because it means something different in their context. But all I mean here is uh, you know, radial line of sight over densities in the galaxy distribution, right? So this is looking at our, our P of Z as a function of redshift. So it's our galaxy distribution. Uh, this is from the MiceCat simulated galaxy catalog. So what we're doing here is looking at two different sky directions and two different opening angles theta. So this is gonna show up one more time in our sort of key plot. So I wanna make sure I try to explain this well, that sky direction is, is pretty easy. You know, it's just saying, okay, I'm gonna look at a light cone in this direction versus a light cone in this direction. Uh, the opening angle, right, one degree or, or five degrees, and you can remember relative to the, uh, the Suarez Santos sort of localization stripe that we saw earlier, that that was more like 10 degrees. So going to one degree, even though we don't include radial weights uh, in our posterior, we were more interested, in, or sorry, we don't include, that's, I said that wrong. We do include radial weights, of course, we're interested in the distance information. We don't include angular weights on our, uh, in our posterior. The generalized form of that does include angular weights, but this is again where we made a sort of uh, gracious assumption that it was able to be uh, localized to, to one degree angularly. And uh, the way to, to think about what I'm really trying to get across with these differences between one degree and five degree opening angles is the amount of clustering. So if I'm looking at the one degree cases, in what blue and green, you can see they have a lot higher density fluctuations than the purple and yellow curves that are are much smoother. So that's how you should sort of conceptualize this as one degree as being high clustering and five degrees as being low clustering. Of course, I could have kept searching the sky for one degree regions that happen to have significantly lower clustering, but instead we just increase the opening angle. So what we're doing here is we have our galaxy redshift distribution. And then in the shaded region here is the region that we're drawing gravitational wave events from. And uh, it's in this draw that we, um, that we, we, when we do this conversion, right? Because gravitational waves sort of inherently live in distance space and the uh, galaxies inherently live in redshift space. And so when we do our sort of initial conversion in drawing one from the other is when we enforce our, our H naught of 70. And that's why we expect to, to recover that value. Um, the other thing you might notice is, okay, this is a like a pretty aggressive low redshift cut on where we're drawing gravitational waves from only out to 0.3, even though we look to have a pretty complete sample out to, I don't know, maybe 0.9 or something like that. And that's... Uh, because of that detectability integral in our denominator and the fact that we're integrating up to a maximum luminosity distance that is a function of H naught. And so this is with the sort of assumed H naught of 70, but if we you know, allow that to vary as, as we do, uh, it gets pushed up closer to you know, 0.6 something. And, and we wanna make sure that in all cases for all H naughts, we're well below the redshift at which we would start having to account for you know, volumetric or, um, you know, detectability uh, effects of this turnover in the, just, just the redshift out to which this uh, catalog happens to, to simulate. So we have galaxy clustering and we have different amounts of clustering depending on the opening angle. And we're drawing our gravitational wave events from this distribution. And that's, that's maybe something else that I should pause and explain is, highlighting just another area in which we're being generous to the potential systematics, which is that 
we are drawing our gravitational wave event distribution directly from the galaxy population. And so that's assuming that those populations should sort of perfectly map onto each other. Um, in reality, we don't really know if that's true. We don't, we aren't able to sort of simulate the creation of these binary events, you know, we're orders of magnitude to, 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 uh, too small of resolution needed to do that when, you know, so in the, in the simplified sort of smooth case, you can imagine, okay, you know, the galaxies follow a Z cube distribution. And if we let the GW, the gravitational wave events follow that same Z cube distribution, then great, you know, we should be able to match them and we'll see later if there's clustering, but, you know, in practice, it could be that, you know, in some extreme case, I'm not saying this is true, but the gravitational wave events could follow a Z squared or a Z to the fourth. And then you have, you know, your offset becomes problematic in introducing a bias. So this is just another case where we're sort of making a, an optimistic assumption. Okay, so that was one of the, the important factors is clustering, that we need clustering, right? That's the, the bait and switch that I did to get here from here. The other important factor is distance uncertainty. So right in our PG, PDGW term, which was telling us how we should downweight our, our galaxy sample relative to the, the maximum likelihood uh, localization region that LIGO gives to us, we have a, you know, we, that Gaussian weighting. There's some sigma associated with that that is, uh, corresponds to the distance uncertainty. So as I showed you with the 1708-14 uh, detection that the Suarez-Santos paper was looking at, that was something like 500 plus or minus 200 megaparsecs. So, you know, relatively large uh, uncertainties on these measurements. And the problem with that is that, okay, so we want these clusters, they're, they're important to uh, sort of recovering correct information as we'll see just one slide forward. But uh, the problem is as we start to increase the distance uncertainty, we start to wash out the effects of these, these clustered votes. So uh, why don't we just jump right ahead to the sort of main figure from, from our paper. And uh, I'll spend some time unpacking this. So we still have our same two directions and two opening angles, again, sort of highly clustered and uh, not very highly clustered, one degree and five degrees. And you've, you've seen the blue curve before, this is the same blue solid blue curve that I, I was showing before. Uh, these are all the combination uh, of 200 events. And I wanna highlight first that the, the curves that do pretty well, and in fact, one of them even happens to perfectly recover the input value of 70, are those that have one degree opening angles, so a high degree of clustering and have very low, so you know 10% distance localization from our uh, you know, theoretical LIGO detection that we've, we've drawn from our mice cat sample. So in that limit that we have a high degree of clustering and a low distance uncertainty, we're able to do pretty well, you know, and then it's just down to the amount of noise that we're only drawing 200 events, right? But then there's sort of, you can see two failure modes sort of that where things get pushed to one end of the prior um, or the other. So one of them is well, let's, let's take the low redshift one or the, the low H01 first. So in all cases, you know, we have every single direction and opening angle when you increase the distance uncertainty up to 30%, which unfortunately is the realm where a lot of these detections are at the moment. It'll get better, but you know, like I said, 500 plus or minus 200 was sort of the uh, standard for that uh, 170814 event. Uh, you get pushed to the low end. And, and what's happening here, the difference between the low end and the high end is sort of whether that failure is, is entering in the numerator or the denominator. So if we go back to here, right, we talked about when you have high uncertainties, you're washing out that uh, voting information. And if we go back to this plot, comparing our numerator and denominator, you can see that if we were to sort of stretch out, sort of flatten our, our numerator here, then it's gonna become dominated by this denominator. We're, we're washing out this information that's actually giving us our peak. And so the denominator is sort of just suppressing everything and winning out. 
and pushing us all the way to the low end of our prior. And that effect, you know, I, I don't expect them all realistically to, to peak at exactly the locations that they're showing. This is this a, a prior effect. If I went down to you know 20 megaparsecs, you'd see that distance slightly change. But the point is you're washing out your, uh, your voting information uh, in that way with large distance uncertainties. And then at the other end of the spectrum, when you have, even if you have good distance uncertainties, if you have almost no clustering, so remember this, these were the cases of the five degree opening angles with a relatively smooth galaxy distribution. Then we see them get pushed to the high end of the prior because now the numerator is winning out and that voting sample is sort of getting pushed up to, to uh, higher redshifts and the, just the volume effect is winning out and the numerator, the denominator is not able to sufficiently kill it off because you know, we have these good uncertainties with, um, with this high, high voting sample. So that's the, the sort of main result of having these two failure modes. And I wanna sort of codify that in this takeaway message statement that the Bayesian method uh, for using, well, let me say it, the full thing. Using the Bayesian method, dark sirens can reliably measure the Hubble constant only when there is sufficiently ga sufficient galaxy clustering and distance localization. And that's effectively the bright siren case. So maybe I can restate this as, you know, I just tried to make the, the mathematical argument uh, with, with these plots, but I wanna step back and maybe try to make a more, I don't know, big picture logical argument. So, if we consider the two extremes, right? On one hand, we have a perfect bright siren case where we have some you know, delta function detection uh, of the, the redshift and the distance, then I think we'd all agree that we can uh, perfectly get some h naught measurement from delta function detections. Now, go to the other end of the spectrum. If you have very poor distance uncertainties, so you're washing out all your votes no matter what they are, and you would have just a perfectly smooth, let's say Z cubed galaxy distribution, right? P of Z, then you don't have anything to break the degeneracy. You just have a numerator that's identical to the denominator and it becomes perfectly flat in your posterior and you not get any information. Like I said, you don't have anything to break the degeneracy. So on one hand, we have delta functions, bright sirens where we can uh, perfectly measure H naught in, in theory. On the other hand, if we get very poor distance information and completely smooth galaxy distributions, then we have no information to break our distance degeneracy, right? D equals C0 over H naught. And all I'm trying to point out here is that, okay, well, obviously somewhere between these two extremes, there, there's gradations of how well you're gonna be able to do. And the current distance uncertainty uh, you know, percentages and the, you know, the current ability to localize is problematic in recovering an unbiased H naught. So that's the main takeaway um, that I wanna have from, from this paper that we put out last year. And again, I'm not saying that this can never work. Obviously, as we continue to increase the number of events, of events add more detectors, uh, you know, increase the sensitivity of these things, increase the modeling of you know, higher order modes and things like that. We're always sort of marching towards uh, approaching the, the bright siren limit. So I, I don't wanna paint too bleak a picture and make it sound like the, this Bayesian method can never work. Um, I just wanna urge caution in sort of believing any current uh, statements about Dark Siren's ability to weigh in on the Hubble tension, especially with, you know, any paper that's using a, a very few number of events. And uh, I guess one more thing to point out before we move on to a, a potentially different way to do it, which I'll, I'll maybe point out there, is there a better way to do this? But before moving on, I want to say that the, you know, you might say, okay, well, why do we even care about these Dark Sirens when we have bright sirens, because uh, we do have the one, 1708, 17, 
And unfortunately, what they're finding, I think, is that that was a, a relatively rare event that a lot of those projections that I showed you before from the, you know, the, the number increasing and then the 2% the measurement being just around the corner was sort of being optimistic that we would find a lot of those sort of bright side, you know, neutron star, neutron star mergers right in our cosmic backyard. And uh, I was hearing Marcelli Suarez Santos, I'll name drop her again, Michigan person, um, was giving a colloquium a couple of weeks ago. And they're finding that that, that event was, is looking more and more atypical and that we shouldn't expect, uh, you know, just a, a, a huge ramp up in the, in the number of those types of, of bright sirens. So given that the vast majority of these events will be dark sirens, you know, it's, it's, we would like to still be able to get some, some H0 information out of it. So that's where this potentially better method comes in. So the, the, the general idea here is we have two different populations, right? So now as you've seen something similar in uh, redshift space. Now I'm just going to, to distance space, co-moving distance chi here. And because this is the, the area that the gravitational waves live in, so let's go into that space instead of the galaxy space. And let's say we have some uh, gravitational wave population that I'm showing here in red. And then we have some galaxy population that we expect to trace uh, the GW population, or you could say that in reverse. You know, we, we expect them to trace each other. Uh, now, of course, that's dependent on H naught. That when, whenever we make this conversion from distance to redshift space, we're reliant on H naught. And so you can see that you know the overlap between these two populations is going to be maximized when we have the, in this case, the, the input, the enforced value of 70 versus, you know, we go to 40 or 100, you're not going to get the same overlap. And so if we're comparing, you know, any cosmologist, you're looking at two populations that you expect to be correlated, you, you take a correlation function, right? So that's the, the follow-up, you know, proposed better method that these EM and GW sources are expected to be in regions with high matter over densities. So you're going to get an angular correlation. Uh, of course, if we're going into that angular space now, we're just looking angularly on the sky, but we're really interested in radial information. So we have to use tomography where we're going to bin these and compare the, the different bins matching to each other between the, the two populations. And like I said, we expect that the correct H naught will, will maximize the power um, by matching these over densities. So we're going to be using this is some some ongoing work um, based on this formalism from from McQuinn and White from a while back, where you have you know our, our EM and GW populations. This was generically written for um, photometric galaxy distributions, but it holds for anything that just has some uncertainty as opposed to you know a spectroscopic survey. So. You know, we have some, some uncertainties associated with the, the locations of, of these two populations. And we're going to, to bin this data and compute our, our, uh, our CLs, our shot noise, and then the number density of the two populations in our bins. And importantly, this bias term. So you might say, okay, why aren't we just you know, trying to do some best fitting between these two populations just in this distance space? And it's because where we were ignoring bias with our, our Bayesian method, or I should say not ignoring it, but uh, assuming it was zero and just testing the statistics of the method itself, in the correlation function, we're gonna be able to explore, uh, explore these biases more. So if there's, like I said before, in the example of the sort of Z cubed versus Z to the fourth versus Z squared distributions, you know, if there is that bias and they don't perfectly trace each other, there's going to be some offset between these distributions that simply induced by the bias and not by H naught at all. So uh, that that's something that we can encode in this formal formalism, and uh, hopefully hoping to implement that over the next year or so and uh, answer some of these questions. So this ongoing work with Neil Delal is up up there with you all at perimeter just nearby. Uh, obviously, my advisor Dragon. And uh, Dong Hui Zhang at Penn State, you know, we can look at do these populations truly chase each trace each other? 
you know, again, getting to this bias question, um, what's the optimal binning? You know, pretty early on, we're probably going to be limited just by the number of events in uh, and our redshift distribution and, and how many bin, bins we can use. But we want to, you know, up, apply it to some some simulated data and sort of find that optimal binning result. Uh, another another interesting thing is how do the galaxy population cuts affect the results? So um, again, thinking about that sort of z squared versus z cubed versus z to the fourth thing uh, in the sim just a, an oversimplified case, we don't know whether uh, you know let's say we in a simplified thing, you know, let's say we try to correlate them with spiral galaxies versus elliptical galaxies. You know, I have no reason to think that that would actually be, you know, an important cut. But we can do all of these different, you know, luminosity cuts on the galaxies. It might be a more interesting one. You know, are they more likely to reside in higher mass galaxies or lower mass galaxies? And seeing, you know, which if we can find a population that maybe more accurately uh, traces these these two populations. Uh, what role does systematics play? And you know the, what conditions are necessary to measure H not from dark sirens is sort of the overarching question. You know, is, is there a similar effect where the, there's a critical distance that distance uncertainty that you need or or amount of clustering? Um, I don't expect that to be the case for the correlation function method as much, but you know maybe it can still inform us on the Bayesian uh, method. And I would note that that that's a potential area of follow-up in the, the Bayesian technique is that, you know, we didn't follow up and say, okay, there's a problem with the distance uncertainty and the clustering having to meet certain thresholds. We didn't quantify those thresholds, one, primarily because the effects were so large relative to just the statistical variations of random sampling, but secondarily because we were more interested in moving on to this correlation function. But uh, yeah, that, that could be uh, an interesting open question as to, you know, exactly what are those thresholds to be able to, to rely on that Bayesian dark siren method. So uh, that's the last I'll say about that. Uh, to summarize gravitational waves, promising new probe of, of cosmology that we hope can soon weigh in on the Hubble tension. Most mergers, unfortunately, are dark sirens, meaning they don't have the end counterparts. And so we need that clustering information and the good localization, i.e. to be in the bright siren limit. We're not in the bright siren limit, but more in that direction than the, the smooth, poor localization case, and that there's a potential improvement um, by using a correlation function method. So thank you. I see Niels uh, at the top of the list here. Oh, maybe. oh yeah, sorry. Um... Oh, but Will can go ahead, I guess, you know, with the questions in the room, probably first. <laughs> uh, yeah, just, so I've got a couple of questions. So first, when you're talking about localizing the galaxies, is there any reason why you would want to use, say, photometric redshift over spectroscopic? Because you've already got the locations. You got the you got the angular location, I guess, for all of these events and down. Wouldn't it make more sense to follow it up with a spectroscopic redshift if you wanted to get this uh, tighter distance measurement? If, I'm understanding uh, the Bayesian, like the Bayesian procedure correctly. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it would be better to have spectroscopic information. I, I wasn't going to assume that we had that good information. Most of the spread in the overall P of Z comes from just the fact that we're summing over nearly 100,000 galaxies. So, even if you had good localization from each individual one, when you sum them up, there's still going to be some spread to that overall population. But yeah, you're right. There, there's a little bit more uh, uncertainty introduced by doing it photometrically. And uh, if you could do it spectroscopically, that would be better. I guess an additional question I have relating to that is um, more so to do, I was trying to understand uh, that sort of major plot you showed at the end with these two failure modes. So I'm trying to understand the one with the lack of clustering, which Okay, in the case of there, if there isn't as much clustering, that means there's only so many galaxies you have to sum over their red. You'd have to sum over their locations and way with it's that. Not so much the, it's not so much the number; it's it's just the distribution. But so, as I understand, in the low clustering case, it would just be a couple of in-field galaxies as opposed to a something tightly packed like a like the coma cluster, right? Or I mean, I completely I, I, your use of that. 
Uh, again, I, I'm, I wouldn't focus so much on the, you could have the same number of galaxies in a clustered versus non-clustered case, theoretically, right? And just, it's just about whether more of your votes are coming from a single redshift or they're more distributed in redshift space. Okay. Okay, uh, Mike, you have a question online? Uh, I'm just trying to understand the difference between the two methods. I mean, for, you know, from a broad perspective, they're all sort of cross correlation, but uh, they're, I guess, implemented differently in the sense that I, I got heavy pushback when I tried to, to categorize the Bayesian method as a, as a correlation method on the Snowmass white paper. So if you if you well, want to make that argument, go ahead. <laughs> it seems that way to me. Um, you know, you're you're correlating some p of you know distribution, and in both cases, you've got a distribution in distance from the sirens and a distribution in redshift, and you're trying to match them somehow. Uh, whereas, I guess in the second case, you're getting more information from larger scales, but there's still information in the on small scales, presumably. Um, which I, I suppose is incorporated in your correlation method, depending on which L you choose. So is, it, is that what it boils down to, basically different range of scales that you're using, or is it, am I missing something else? Uh, good question. I think we're limited to some relatively low Ls when we look at our, our cuts that we're going to have to make, but that, that's still something we're, we're exploring. Um, I guess I just think about it as, you know, well, number one, a big benefit of the correlation function method is being able to more explicitly account for this bias and systematic effects. So even if you wanted to say big picture, they're getting at the same thing. I think the correlation function is more conducive to taking into account systematics. Um, I, I tend to think of it sort of more as um, this sort of sensitivity of this, this Bayesian method to, to the interplay between our numerator and denominator and how you know it, it's just very sensitive to any sort of stretching uh, or downweighting of these votes. And if we're just able to get this angular correlation uh, and bin it, it, it should be just a little more robust and that we're not sort of comparing these two, you know, volume weighted populations. Okay, Sorry. Thank you. did you have a question? Oh yeah, sure, um, you know, um, I would like, but just to maybe you know answer Mike's question, um, you know, so this Bayesian method, you know, corresponds just to you know, I mean, it corresponds just to using the correlation at zero lag. And yeah, you know, if, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, okay, well, yeah. So Emery, so uh, yeah, I mean, um, so, sorry, Neil, uh, but is that true? I mean, isn't there any distance information in this? Bayesian method you or maybe Emery didn't explain it very well. I thought there was some distance weighting. Uh, right. So when you measure like a correlation function, right, so you can choose to weight the samples however you like, right? You know, mm -hmm. fundamentally, you know, in this Bayesian method, uh, you know, what they're using just is, you know, the galaxies, you know, that you think could be the actual host galaxy of the event. And so in that sense, it's only using zero lag. <laughs> uh, so, so these are only galaxies within within the uh, sky localization of LIGO. Is that, that yeah that was my understanding of like uh, yeah um yeah. Is, is that true Emery that you, you only look at galaxies within the sky localization you don't look at them outside the sky localization? Uh, yes and of course you can make a decision as to you know exactly what percentage region you want to cut off at, but yeah, it doesn't make sense to you okay. know, just computationally weigh yourself down by including everything that has almost no probability of being the true host. Okay, I mean, thank you, thanks. Go ahead, Neil. Go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Oh yeah, sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah so I was just trying just to understand like physically the origin of these you know biases that you were showing in that in, um, in that plot. Um, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, so this plot. So. Okay, right. So, like, yeah. So these, yeah. Like, can you just like walk me through this again? I mean, it's like, like, so if I had, let's say, like, you know, no, you know, no, no large scale structure, but also if I had like an infinite number of of of, of galaxies, you know, how would this plot look? An infinite number of galaxies, but a non-infinite number of gravitational wave events. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. 
So I would have thought that this, uh, you know, in that in, in that limit, just would be like a you know like a uniform like uh, a constant, but like you're saying it's not right. I'm I'm saying so that this what's maybe confusing is there's there's two things going on here, and the problem with this sort of high H not failure mode is it's showing poor clustering, but high certainty in the distance measurement. So if I were to tune down that distance certain uncertainty, um, then I would get these two, right? The numerator and denominator would be just these purely, you know, corresponding to Z cubed things, and you would have no information. But when you're very certain <laughs> about this, uh, you know, distance, even when you have a, a smooth galaxy distribution, that's when you start to uh, have this this volume effect went out, and that you're very certain that these things on the high end of your sample um, are 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 the true hosts. And unfortunately. Uh, again, I, sh I don't know if I pointed this out, but this is most of the 200 events underlying this, these, these high H naught curves are sort of not peaking in this range and, and just sort of exponentially increasing up to H naught of 100. It's just that some of them do happen to peak in this range because of the random distance draws that's causing it to sort of peak here. But, but yeah, it's, it's the, the certainty in, in that distance measurement that is Sort of subverting that expect expectation, but I agree with you that, and it's true that if you have poor uh, distance localization and bad clustering, you would get no information, and it would be flat. Okay, yeah, like I guess I'm still like, yeah, I'm not quite understanding, but maybe I can ask you more about this. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd be happy to go into it and show you some more stuff. Okay, any final questions? Anybody in the room? Anybody online? Okay, all right. Well, thanks, Emory, again. Thank you for having me. Very nice talk. Thanks so much. Thank you.